We're going to continue our series, uh, Jesus the Miracle Worker, part two. And, uh, and I want to read out of John chapter five, verse two. We're going to be looking at another miracle of Jesus. And it, it reads like this. It says, now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to, said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Verse 10 says, so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said that to you? Take up your bed and walk. Verse 13 says, now the man who had been healed didn't know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. I wanna preach today uh, from really the message titled, The Miracle by the Pool. The Miracle by the Pool. Uh, let's pray together over the preaching of God's word. God, we're grateful for you today. And God, God what an honor it is, uh, God, that even though we can't gather in person, God, the, the fact that we can watch this, uh, some watching with family members, some watching with roommates, some watching alone, God, that we can actually gather around your word and gather around worshiping you. God, what an honor it is. And so, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us today in a profound way. God, that you would help us to be good stewards of the miraculous things that you want to do in and through our lives. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. Amen. Uh, have you ever been in a situation uh, where you thought you were ready for something? Like, like you really thought that you were prepared. Uh, you thought that you had been trained up. You thought that you were ready for it. Um, only to realize once you get into it that you were actually really only just ready for the initial phase of that thing. You weren't really ready for the long haul. You were just ready for the initial moment. Uh, this happened to me, and this was fully exposed, um, the day that Christina and I had our children. And by Christina and I, I mean the day that Christina gave birth to our children. Okay? Um, I, I remember we showed up uh, uh, to the hospital um, on the day um, that, that we were to have our kids and, and, and we show up and I was pretty hyped. My adrenaline was pumping. I, 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 was, I was ready to go. And, and we get in this room and, uh, and, and we're kind of, that's kind of the holding room. It's the holding area. And, and, and then they bring us into another room where Christina kind of gets ready and puts on the gown and does the whole deal. And at that point, um, we were given a time. So they, we were expecting to kind of go into the room to have the children at a particular time. And, uh, and a nurse comes in and says, hey, um, we actually have to, have to slide you back uh, because there was an emergency C-section that, that needs to take place with your doctor. And so we're gonna, we're gonna slide you down. And I don't know if you've ever had this moment, but I knew in that moment that I had peaked too early. <laughs> Emotionally, uh, I, I just had peaked too early. M my adrenaline was high. I had the stuff on and I'm ready to go. And they say, hey, we're gonna push you back. And they ended up pushing us back. It was about an hour, hour and a half uh, that they had pushed us back. And I could tell I was drained by the time uh, that this happened. So they take, they come in about an hour and a half, two hours later, they take Christina to a room. I was expecting to go with her to the room and they didn't take me. They said, hey, we're, we're gonna get her all set up. We're gonna get her all set up and get her all ready to go. And then we'll bring you in just before it happens. And I'm like, okay, so they, they take her away and I'm sitting in a room and now I have this gown on and I have the, I don't know why they gave me like the thing, that, the hair net thing, but, 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 but they, give me, they, they give me all this stuff and, and, and I'm there and, uh, and they're like, hey, okay, it is, it's now time. 
And I thought I was ready for this, but I'm already emotionally drained because the two hour time difference. And, and, and they bring me into a room. And I, when I, right when I walk in this room, Christina's laid out like she is the Christ. She, she, she has her arms like just out and, and, and she's numb and they're getting ready to go. And, and right when I walked in, I gotta be honest, I was lightheaded. Like I thought I was going to pass out. Like this was a lot on me. Like this was a lot on me physically, emotionally. This was a lot. I don't know what Christina was going through, but I was going through much, okay? And the reality is I I was ready for the initial thrust. I I was ready for the initial moment. Right when we get to the hospital, I was ready to go, but but I just really actually wasn't ready to to watch this play out. I, I wasn't ready to endure this entire experience. And here's what I believe. I believe that our world is great at the appearance of preparation. I I believe our world is great at the appearance of preparation. Like I think like, for example, when you get a college degree, that's a great thing. That's an amazing thing. That's a great accomplishment. However, that is the appearance of preparation. Uh, People get certificates and, and they do, they take online courses and that's great. And that's incredibly helpful, but that is the appearance of preparation. People get letters of recommendation, and that's an amazing thing. I I write many letters of recommendation, and that's great. And I tell people, you know, who are looking at hiring somebody how awesome that person is, and yet that is the appearance of preparation. See, See, the reality is we don't really know what's in us until we find ourselves in the situation. These are things that testify that we're ready for something without actual proof that we will be able to navigate it once we are in it. What I've come to realize is is this, is that life is about the moment after you get what you want. Life is always about the moment after. Life is not about that, that, that moment that you've been dreaming about, thinking about. Life is what you do with it after you have had that moment. This is why movies are great for entertainment, but not great for life training. Because movies always stop shortly after the climax. So, so, so movies have this buildup, this buildup, this buildup. The climax is resolved, and then it, it kind of starts to land the plane a little bit, but, but it doesn't land the plane quite all the way, and then the movie's over, and we go, oh, man, that movie was great. That was awesome. I'm glad that they resolved some of the issues, and I'm glad that that, that, that was figured out. The problem is that that's not real life. In, in fact, there comes a moment after every like, you know, key moment in life where things flatline. And the question is, what do you do in that moment? What do you do with those moments where life seems to flatten out after you got what you wanted? See, we don't, hap- we don't see what happens in movies after the flatline of the climax of the movie. In, in fact, we don't really know if Andy Dufresne uh, and you know, Red's uh, business worked out in Mexico. We're not really sure. We know Andy Dufresne breaks out of Shawshank Prison and, and, and his boy meets up with him down the road, you know, uh, after he gets out in Mexico and Andy Dufresne, uh, you know, had the desire for this business that he would take people out fishing and things of like that. But we don't really know if that business goes belly up. We don't know if it forecloses. We, we, we don't know if it goes bankrupt. We don't know anything. Like we don't know if Simba and Nala go the distance. We don't know that. We just know at the end of the movie, they end up together, but we don't know what happens after they've been married for like seven years. All all, all we know is like, oh man, see, see, real life has the flat line. Real life has the moment after the moment, the season after the moment. And in movies, we don't really need to know, but in real life, it is very important that we know how to navigate the flat line after the moment. In fact, my point, my only point today is this, is that when a moment of healing finds you, the subsequent course of events are not irrelevant. I really believe this, that when a moment of healing finds you, the subsequent course of events are not irrelevant. What what an amazing moment in the scriptures we hear in John chapter five. Verse three, it says, it says, in these, it was talking about there's this pool and it's called Bethesda. And it says, in this, this pool area, there's a multitude of invalids. And some are blind, some are lame, some are paralyzed. It says that one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. 
That is a year longer than I have been alive. This man had been an invalid. It says, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time, he said, do you want to be healed? Have you ever uh, found yourself in an environment where you weren't really sure what you had in common with those around you? This was absolutely my experience the first time um, I went to Christian university. I went, to, I went to a Christian university. I spent my first two years um, at a junior college and then I went to Christian university and it was uh, my first time ever in Christian school. I, I, I didn't grow up in Christian school. Um, uh, I got, gave my heart to Christ when I was 17 years old and I, I went to Northwest University in good old Kirkland, Washington. Uh, it's where I met my wife, so I'm glad that I went there. Uh, however, when I got there, I was like, these people are strange. And, and I was a little weirded out by the whole Christian college experience. Um, and I thought, surely I have nothing in common with these people. The reason why I didn't think I had much in common with them is because I felt like, man, these kids have like a lot of stuff figured out. They know like the Christian lingo. They, 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 know, how to, they know when to lift up their hands. They know how to do this Christian life. And I felt like for me, I felt like I was a train wreck. I felt like I loved God, I really loved God, and, uh, but I still had like a lot of things I was working out. And, and, and so, so I actually didn't think I had a lot in common with them uh, because I actually, um, I couldn't really see their infirmities. I couldn't see their shortcomings. I, 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 I didn't really know where they were at and I just assumed that they were at a place that I was not at. See, I thought I was the only one that still needed Jesus to do a work. The reason why I thought that is because there wasn't a pool. I, th I thought that because there, there wasn't a pool that we would all go to, which just by the nature of the fact that you went to the pool, acknowledged that I have an infirmity. J just the fact that you, you showed up there uh, demonstrates. See, see, in our culture today, um, we will not even put ourselves in the right position if we feel like we're the only ones. <clears throat> In fact, in fact, this is why I call it the altar call game. This is why we play the altar call game. And now again, I didn't grow up in church, but I've learned the altar call game. I, I understand the altar call game. Now, now, if you didn't grow up in church or you don't even know what I mean by an altar call, let me explain to you something that takes place sometimes in church. Sometimes every once in a while, we do it at Grace City and uh, some churches do it all the time. Some churches never do it. But um, uh, some of you, maybe you've been in Christian or church environments where at the end, the Preacher is preaching, and at the end, you know, he'll give a response. And what he will ask people to do in the, in the congregation is he will ask people to get up from their seat and walk down to the front so people can pray for them and so that they can, and they might even say something really preachy, really awesome, like, you know, if you take eight steps to the front, God will come across the galaxy to meet you right where you're at. Might even say something like that. And, 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 and now I had to learn the altar call game. Because whenever a preacher does that, now listen, that altar call could be directly for you. Like he, that preacher could say your address. He could say your first and last name. He could say your social security number. And, and at the end, he's gonna say, okay, as soon as the band starts playing, everybody come up. And everybody in the room will do this. Nobody will make the decision based on where they are at and, and, and what condition they're in. They will look around. And they're not going up, and you're not going up, and I'm not going up until I see about four or five people start walking up. And it's amazing how there are so many times where we won't even put ourselves in the right position to meet Jesus just because we might be the only one. But with the pool, it's fascinating because, because with the pool, everybody who shows up, it is assumed that there is some type of infirmity. It is an assumption that everybody there needs to be there. See, I call that the commonality of infirmity. The commonality of infirmity. But I think the reality is, is the person even watching maybe with you right now, the thing that you two have in common is the commonality of infirmity. The thing right now, if we were all gathering together across all of our services, the thing that we would all have in common is the commonality of infirmity. The only difference is, is that we can't always see what those infirmities are. 
And so we have to be mindful and, and, and we have to be careful that we don't you know, resist situations and resist opportunities to actually meet with Jesus and to actually get healed from the thing we need to get healed from just because we feel like we might be the only one that comes up for that altar call. See, this man is positioned at the pool simply because he needed to be there. And because he is there, he comes face to face with Jesus Christ. Now, now, what's interesting is that his infirmity keeps him out of the pool, but not from going to the pool. So, so what he ends up saying, in fact, it was, it was rumored that what would happen is that the pool would start to get stirred. And the first person in the pool would be the person that would be healed. And this man tells Jesus, you know, when the pool starts getting stirred, I, because of my infirmity, cannot get into the pool. There's, there's other people that are, that are able to get into it before I am, and so I cannot get the healing that I need. And yet, praise God, just because he had maybe been there a handful of times and hadn't been able to get into the pool because of his infirmity, his infirmity didn't keep him away from the pool. I'm a firm believer in this, is that your infirmity is not as debilitating as you are allowing it to be. Your infirmity is not as debilitating as you are allowing it to be. I, I think where we find our miracle is when we go as far as we possibly can. So some of you, okay, maybe you can't get in the pool. Maybe you're dealing with literal physical things. Maybe you're dealing with emotional things and you cannot get into the pool. My question is this, are you at least at the pool? Are, are, are you at least getting to the pool? Are, are you at least on the way to the pool? Are, are you at least making plans to go to the pool? Like, like how far ha, have you went or have you just resigned to the fact that you have an infirmity? I love Jesus asking this question too, and it seems like an obvious question, right? Do you want to be healed? Feels like an obvious question, right? Of course, if you have an infirmity, of course you wanna be healed. Healed, but, but what I have found after years of pastoring people is this reality. There are many times where our infirmity becomes our identity. Yeah, so true. And after 38 years, it, it would stand to reason that his infirmity has become his identity. Wow. And, and, and so what Jesus would ask you, what Jesus would ask me when he's asking us, do we wanna be healed? Uh, this is another way, honestly, that he's asking it is, are you okay with me changing you? Wow. Are, 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 are you okay with change? Are, are, are you okay with a different life? Now, now, it is amazing what we can get used to. I pastor people all the time that they know what the answer is. They know what the next thing is. They know what their next step of faith is, and yet they can't do it. Why? Because they have gotten used to living in the life that they've been living in for a long period of time. So Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? It says the sick man answered him in verse seven. Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water stirred up while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed and walk. And at, and at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. And now that day was the Sabbath. Now, uh, we assume, this is so big, we assume the experience of others and compare that to our real life experience. Now, this is why social media is very, very dangerous because we assume the experience of others. And then we compare that assumption, whether it's reality or not, uh, with our real life experience. In fact, speaking of Instagram, I was on Instagram the other day and I thought a guy named Joe Tremini, I thought he illustrated this uh, really, really well. So, so I, I, wanna, I wanna show a photo. Um, now these were, now th he posted um, and this was the same photo and literally he was illustrating exactly what I'm talking about. You know, if you were to look at this photo, you would say, man, what a beautiful picture. Looks like he's on a flight somewhere going, you know, looks like he's in Hawaii or something like that. And, uh, and, and to me, this, this is Instagram, right? This is what we do to other people. We make assumptions about what they're experiencing. We make assumptions about what's going on in and through their life and maybe how God is working in and through their life. And then, and then literally on the same post, this was, it was like one of those things where you, slot, where you, you know, swipe it. This was actually the photo <laughs> that he took. And this was actually what he was experiencing. And I feel like this is so true to our lives. 
We make assumptions about how God's moving in somebody else's life. We make assumptions about how he's operating and we compare that with our real life. What's interesting, he felt like he had to get to the pool because he assumed the experience of the people that had gotten into the pool. We're not even sure if the myth is correct. In, in, in fact, the reality is, is that, you know, what he said is he said, hey, you know, people would wait for the pool to be stirred. And then the rumor was that if you're the first one in the pool, you get healed and nobody else does. We don't even know if that's true. And so he is making an assumption on how God works. He's making an assumption and he thinks that he has to get to the pool. He thinks it's about the pool. He thinks his miracle is about the pool. He thinks this mighty move of God is about the pool. And he thinks, man, I have to get there. And yet he is unable to get there. That's what I love about Jesus. And in fact, I wanna end with a couple of thoughts with this because one of the things that I love about Jesus is that this man could not get to the water. Couldn't get to the water. And, and yet, check this out. I love what Jesus said about himself. What did Jesus say about himself? He says, you know what? I am the living water. And everybody who drinks of me will never thirst again. And even though the man couldn't get into the water, the living water came to him. Living water comes to him, shows up right where he's at. See, this man had been making assumptions about how to get a miracle. And the assumption he made is, I have to get in the pool. Can I just tell you, the miracle was never about the pool. It was about the faith that the pool provided. It's what it was always about. This is why, by the way, I actually think it might be a little bit good for the church that we can't gather for a season because I think for too long we've thought, oh man, it's about the gathering. And I'm just here to tell you, Christianity is not about the gathering. Following Jesus is not about the gathering. It is about the faith that the gathering provides. That's what the gathering does. Because here's what's gonna happen. There's gonna come an end to this thing and we're gonna be able to gather again and we're gonna go, oh, it was never about the, the gathering. It was about when I'm in a room with other people's faith and when I'm around other people that believe and have faith that stirs up my faith, it's amazing what God can do. Yeah. It's not about the pool. It's about the faith yeah, right. that the pool provides. The man discovers this. He realizes this. In fact, Jesus even gives him an opportunity to exercise his faith when he asks him, do you want to be healed? The man thinks he's missing his moment, but what he doesn't realize is the moment found him. Man, I keep missing it. I keep missing it. I keep missing it. Now, you, you only miss Jesus if you keep your eyes closed. But if you'd open up your eyes and begin to see that, man, God is all around you, wanting to meet you right where you're at, in the middle of your infirmity. He can do miraculous things in your life. Jesus asked them another curious thing. Jesus was always having people do interesting things, right? First he asked them kind of a funny question, do you wanna be healed? And then he has them do something else. He says, hey, um, take up your bed and walk. Take up your bed and walk. Jesus tells him to take up his bed. Now, now the reality is this, you gotta think about this. Like why would he need his bed? It wasn't like his real bed. It was his portable little like, bed. Oh, like, why, why would Jesus have him? He could have just left it there. Just could have left it there and, and, and kept walking. In fact, it would have been more convenient for him to leave it there and go home. And Jesus said, hey, hey, take up your bed, pack it up, start walking. I, a little while ago, I, I found, a, found a picture from me. You ever see like old pictures of you? And you're like, that's not me. <laughs> I saw a picture of me from high school. And um, I looked at the picture and I looked at it closely because I'm like, my eyes look really red. <laughs> if you know, you know. If you don't know, good on you. You're sanctified and holy. Like, Man, my eyes are really bloodshot. I must have had a great time that day. Um, and, and I thought, what a far cry from who I am today. In fact, just this last year, or excuse me, just this last week, um, on March 27th, 
I, I, it, was, it was the day, in fact, I, I remembered it on that day. I didn't really remember it until it was like the day before on March 26th. I looked and I went, oh, wow, tomorrow it will be 20 years that I've been following Jesus. March 27th, following Jesus for 20 years. March 27th of 2000, gave my heart to Christ. I was just looking at a picture of me in high school from that time, just before that time, and went, man, this is a different person. And for me, it was such a great reminder. In fact, for me, uh, in a lot of ways, it was me, it was my mat. It was my bed. And I went, what a great reminder of what God can do in your life if you would just surrender it over to him. I, I think Jesus had him pick up his bed and have him carry it. It's because you and I, man, man we need to remember just what Jesus has healed us from. We gotta be reminded so that when after the moment happens and there is a flat line, you have something on your persons that can remind you, man, God has brought me along. God has been faithful. God's been for me. God has made a way we can not forget. I believe this with my whole heart. The distance between a miracle and ungratefulness is our memory. The distance between ungratefulness and a miracle is our memory. Have we remembered what God has done for us? Have we, have we, in fact, what a great time to remember what God has done. Come on, there's gotta be a little bit of like King David in us. In fact, even before he was king, when he went to slay Goliath, he said, no, no, you know what? I, I've, I've killed a bear and I've killed a lion. This uncircumcised Philistine will be no different. There's gotta be some times right now. I know some of you, you're going through heartbreak and you're going through heartache and you might lose your job and family is stressful right now. And you're just bogged down from being in the house for the last couple of weeks. But you gotta know, no, God's brought me through some things. And so I'm not drawing from an empty well. I'm drawn from something. I, I, I know what's ahead. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against me is gonna prosper. This man would need the reminder and so do you and I. We need the reminder. And then in verse 10, it says, so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath, it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man told me to do it. He says, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said that to you? Take up your bed and walk. Now, now the Bible says that in that moment, he didn't know. He didn't know who it was. In fact, Jesus had to come back and meet him at church and say, hey, remember me? <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth, that was who did this for you. He immediately gets questioned about what happened to him. Here's what you gotta understand. After the miracle, the pressure will mount. Yeah. Right, so, so there's gonna, God will and has done amazing things in your life. Then when the flat line happens, a part of the flat line happening is that there's going to be external realities that come in. You might have family members. You might have friends that go, really? No, no, you're still the same person. No, 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 no. no. You might have some internal battles going on, but you're gonna have some, in fact, right about the time you start getting generous and then you lose your job. There's gonna be some realities that happen in life that are gonna try to impose itself onto you. The question is, what do you do in those moments? I, I, I got a few things of just what's next and we can take it right from the scripture. Number one, you need to trust that you've been healed. You need to trust you've been healed. Jesus said, get up and take up your mat. Get up. Now, now think about this for a second. He's saying get up to somebody who has been an invalid for 38 years. I mean, I, I know people that have like a knee surgery and a year later, they're, they're okay, they're healthy, but they still don't trust their knee. Imagine you're, you're paralyzed, you can't walk for 38 years. And somebody says, hey, get up, start walking. You need to trust you've been healed. And listen, we're not the kind of church that's like a blab it and grab it and name it and claim it. And we're not like, you know, like, you know, encouraging people to live like a, a disillusioned life. But the reality is the Bible does say that we are to call things that aren't as though they are. And especially when something happens, come on, we need to trust that we have been healed. Some of you are going through anxiety. You need to trust you've been healed. You're going through depression. I'm going to trust that I've been healed. My marriage was shaky, but man, God worked through it. But now we're going through another season. You need to trust your marriage has been healed. 
Whatever you're going through, whatever your circumstances, you need to trust that you've been healed. You need to get up. Number two, you need to not forget. Don't forget. So what that means is you need to carry your mat. You need to carry your mat. You know, a practical way of doing that is just praying every day. God, you've brought me through so much. Some of you, you even need to name some of those things. God, you brought me through this. And when, whenever I would go through this sin, I felt guilt and shame and condemnation. And yet I don't wrestle with that thing anymore. It's, some of you, listen, you, you, you went through cancer and you went through chemo and you went through the whole thing. And yet here you are on the other side of that. And you ought to thank God, you know, you know God, I went through chemo and I went through cancer and here I am on the other side. God, you brought me through that. Whatever that thing is, listen, you need to carry your mat. You need to be reminded of it. That's why the Bible says that we overcome what, by the blood of the lamb and by what? The word of our testimony. The reason why your story matters, the reason why our story matters is because it reminds us, oh yeah, that's right. That this is the thing I used to lay on. This is the thing that, that used to be symbolic of my infirmity, but here I am, the thing that used to carry me, now I'm carrying it. And here I am, why? Because of the grace and mercy of God. And then finally, oh, this is amazing. You need to give Jesus the glory. So you need to remember his name. You need to give Jesus the glory. You see, this man was healed, but he didn't know who to give glory to. He didn't know. Even when he was asked about it, like, I don't know. Didn't get his name. You need to constantly, it is not rhetoric to say, to God be the glory. It's not rhetoric. I think we live in a culture and a time where, where people almost feel funny saying that because everybody, say, I, 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 everybody says it because it's true. Yeah. To God be the glory. Where would I be without him? Where would I be without God? You need to give glory to the one who made you, to the one who knows you, to the living water that shows up when you couldn't get in the pool. Living water came and introduced himself to you, wants to introduce himself to you. In fact, if, if you're watching this right now and you're not following Jesus, I, I really believe that there's no better time like the present than to give your life over to Christ because the living water has stepped in and invaded your space right now. He said, come to me all who are weary and heavy burden and I will give you rest. See, when you have those moments, we need to know how to handle this part of the moment part of the moment where afterwards things kind of flatline a little bit. And if you can steward that moment, you'll continue to see God do amazing things. You're reminded that God loves you, reminded that God knows you, reminded that God did that thing and reminded that it was Jesus all along.